whole video is about this thing. Seriously. This chair looks like a piece of garbage, and I did find it by the side of the road, but this is a real piece of Greenwood country furniture. It's handmade, and it is a link to a whole long tradition of rural Greenwood furniture making. This thing is a masterclass in country chair making, filled with hundreds of tiny useful lessons. If you just know where to look, it's in the post and rung, or ladder back style, and that's a major form in American chair making. The other major style is the Windsor, or stick chair, where the back and rear legs are independent and mortised into a thick plank seat. This is a great style, but you really have to have a source of sawn, dry timber for that seat. In the post and rung style, you don't have two separate pieces of wood for the rear leg and the seat back. Instead, you have one continuous piece of wood. And the chair is basically an open framework made of relatively thin pieces of wood. And the seat is woven out of some sort of natural material like tree bark or even cattails. This style of construction was ideal for the rural craftsman who felled and split his own wood and didn't have the equipment for sawing and drying thick planks. Chairs like this could be made by a single artisan working alone with rudimentary tools. This style goes all the way back to English chair bodgers, who produced chair parts on site in the woods from green timber. English and Irish immigrants brought this tradition to America, and it took root in Appalachian states like Kentucky. Chair makers like Chester Cornet eventually became famous for producing this style of chair, and the form probably migrated from Kentucky up into Ohio, where it changed a little bit and became our own regional style of chair making. Chairs like this were almost always made from green wood. In this style, the parts are split or riven from a straight-grained green timber like oak or ash. This kind of controlled splitting follows the grain and allows the maker to create very slender pieces of wood that are exceptionally strong because the grain runs uninterrupted down the whole length of the piece. While the wood is still green, it's soft and easy to work. So the chair maker can use basic tools like a shave horse and a draw knife to shape and refine the parts. This approach allowed the chair maker to go quickly from a living tree all the way to a usable piece of furniture. And this chair is definitely an example of green woodwork. When wood shrinks, it always shrinks more in one direction than in the other. So I can just get the calipers to slip on in one direction, but then if I rotate them 90 degrees, I find that post is thicker. When green wood dries, it always dries into an oval shape because of that differential shrinkage. This chair also has really clear riving marks. These are places where the grain pulled out a little bit during the splitting process and left an uneven surface. These are really easy to see, especially on the back of the chair slats. There's no question that all of these pieces were split out from the log. I can also do the same measuring trick on the seat rungs. And with all of these, the plane of least shrinkage is oriented vertically. And that means when these posts dry out, they clamp down on that vertical part of the tenon where there isn't much motion and the joint is really likely to lock together. The rungs are oriented so that most of the motion is side to side, and the tenons are probably shaved down inside those mortises so they can't make the posts split. All of these building techniques and all the little telltale signs they were used, these are classic greenwood techniques. All of those greenwood techniques are pretty much exactly what we would expect in a chair like this. But what's unexpected is the choice of woods. Ladder back chairs like this were almost always made from tough, springy, ring porous woods like oak, ash, and hickory. And those are the woods that a lot of modern chair makers concentrate on. This chair has a little bit of oak in it, especially in the seat rungs, but most of the chair is made from silver maple, which is a very weird choice. It's a really soft, hardwood. It's not springy like oak or ash. It's not known for splitting well. It's not particularly good wood for bending. It's really an odd choice given what you need this chair to do. I think what's going on is that, well, silver maple was just cheap. It was easy to get. I mean, the chair maker had access to oak. You can see it here, but oak 
even now is a more valuable wood because it's good for firewood and you can make furniture out of it. Silver maple, around here, it's like a weed. I could drive around my neighborhood right now and find silver maple logs being left out for the trash. These chairs were usually only sold for a couple of dollars, so whoever made them had to keep costs down by using inexpensive materials. Silver maple also turns beautifully on the lathe, and this chair was mostly made using a lathe. So when you add all that stuff up, it makes sense. But the timbers you choose for a project like this, well, they have a big impact on how you make it. Whoever made this chair didn't have access to fancy tools or expensive woods, but they understood different timbers, what their properties were, and where to use them for maximum effect. Most of the chair is cheap silver maple, and the pieces for the posts and legs are left thick for strength. The stronger, more expensive oak is reserved for those spots where strength is essential. A low chair like this was meant specifically for casual sitting, and the user would be expected to lean back, putting all kinds of stress on the components. Now, with the chair leaning back, the side rungs would mostly be under compression, and any wood is strong in compression, so silver maple is a good choice. But the front and back rungs would be subject to a lot of twisting, so oak is the timber of choice, especially in the back, where there are only two rungs holding the whole thing together. Up at the seat, the rungs are all oak, and they're carved into a wing shape. As the user sits on the flexible rush seat, the rungs are pulled inward, and that special shape makes them much thicker in cross-section and allows them to resist all that pulling force. The maker obviously understood all the forces that would be at work on this chair, so the top back slat is pegged through the ends with split square pegs, probably made of oak. The other slats aren't pegged, because as long as that top one holds together, everything else will be fine. From the outside, this chair looks simple, maybe even crude, but its construction demonstrates an intimate knowledge of both materials and physical forces. In fact, I can only find a single flaw in the whole piece. Chair makers usually rotate their front posts so that wood movement is shared equally between front and side rungs. This way, none of the tenons are poking into the wood at a weak point where splitting is likely. You can see this approach on one front post, but the other is aligned all wrong and you can clearly see how the post shrunk against the rungs and split. This is clearly a mistake, but I think it was just a craftsperson moving fast and getting the piece out the door. And the craftsperson wasn't just knowledgeable, he or she was also efficient, clearly focused on quickly creating a product for sale while minimizing waste. This chair is mostly turned on a lathe, and that could have been a traditional pole lathe like the Bodgers used, or even an electric lathe. The crisp details and smooth surface finish make it tough to tell. The lathe work is most obvious in these decorative finials at the tops of the posts. This added an extra bit of flair to the piece and probably made it worth more money. These chairs are usually plain and utilitarian, and a little decoration would have added value. But the lathe was used for much more than decoration. It also smoothed and shaped most of the components into their final finish, and probably also formed the round tenons that make up all the joinery. The maker was also clever in using decorative touches that doubled as layout lines. All over the chair, you can see shallow grooves that were probably cut in with the tip of a skew chisel. These grooves add visual interest, but they also tell the maker where the joinery is going to go. In each of the posts, the grooves marked out locations for the other components. The side rungs are inserted just below the groove, and the front rungs just above. In each case, the mortise holes are drilled so that the edges just kiss that groove and ensure perfect alignment of all the parts. You can see the same thing where the back slats are installed. Each slat has a pair of grooves showing the top and bottom of the mortise that the slat will slide into. This extensive use of the lathe helped make the chair fast to produce and affordable to purchase by combining shaping, surface finishing, layout, and joinery operations all in a single tool. Beyond using the lathe, we can also see the ways that the craftsperson got these chairs out the door by recovering from mistakes and covering up little flaws. For instance, the mortises for the back slats are inconsistent and don't fit very well. They were probably cut while the maker was waiting for the slats to come out of the bending jig. I know some woodworkers would have remade the slats, but this person got them fitted and then just jammed in some scrap at the top of the mortises to tighten things up. A similar thing happened on the top left post, where one of the pins comes right through the front. 
We might see these as major flaws, but the chair was originally painted black, and I think the maker was just counting on paint to hide these sins. I mean, I paint my furniture sometimes. It really does hide stuff. In lots of other places, clear flaws are left in the wood, but they're positioned to minimize the visual impact. Because all the components are split, there are arriving marks all over, but the maker flipped these parts around to make them less visible. On all the back slats, the arriving marks are positioned to the back, where they won't be noticed. The seat rungs show deep, dramatic arriving marks, but these are left totally alone because they're covered by the woven seat and won't be seen. There's even a pretty severe split at the end of one of the rungs, but that one is used at the bottom, and it's rotated to put the flaw underneath where it's not visible. The maker could have chosen to fix many of these flaws or even remake the components, but instead these problems are just shifted to places where they won't be seen and the chair is still ready for sale. Now, we still haven't covered the two most important questions about a chair like this. The first one is, how can a piece of furniture that's made almost totally out of perfectly straight components, well, how can that be comfortable for a human body which is filled with curves and round shapes? How does that work? Well, most of these greenwood post and rung chairs were made with really aggressively bent rear posts. Those posts were put into a steam box to heat up and then taken out and put into a bending form. And they were left there for a couple of days until they absorbed that bend. Sometimes that bend was really dramatic and it made these chairs much more comfortable to sit on. You don't see that in this chair and you don't see it in most Northern Ohio post and rung chairs, they usually have perfectly straight rear posts. I think it's an adaptation to using mostly silver maple as the wood. I don't think it's going to do those really dramatic bends. And I used to think, well, oh, our northern Ohio chair makers, they just weren't as skilled as other ones. But looking at this chair, I figured out they used a couple of very subtle strategies to still make this chair really comfortable. For one thing, these rear posts are cut shorter than the front posts down at the ground. I actually have the chair up on a little support block and I'll take that out. And you can see now the chair is leaning back a lot more because these posts are shorter. When you drop the back of the seat a little bit, it also makes the sitter lean forward a little. So they don't need the back to recline nearly as much. Now, the other thing is that it looks like these rungs are inserted into the rear post at exactly 90 degrees, but they're not. I measured with a protractor and they're actually inserted at three degrees off 90. And that's consistent over the whole chair. Now, three degrees doesn't sound like a lot, but these posts are over 40 inches long. And over that 40 inch long span, Three degrees of lean translates into a lot of travel. The tops of these posts are way behind the feet. So when you combine that soft woven seat, the dropped rear part of the seat, along with the rear posts canted back at three degrees, you have a very simple chair made almost totally from straight components that's still really comfortable, something you can relax in. Of course, the other question is, how the hell is this thing still together? I mean, the chair is at least 50 to maybe 80 years old. It was an indoor piece of furniture for decades until the rush seating failed. They usually fail. That's why I don't like rush seats very much. But then instead of throwing it away, my neighbor took it outside and put it in her garden as decoration. And she left it there for years. I mean, this thing was sitting in her garden when we moved into this house five years ago, and who knows how long before that. Years, maybe even decades of brutal Ohio winters just pummeling this chair. And look, 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 it's, it's still tight. It's still together. I mean, this thing should have fallen apart a long time ago, but I think if I just threw a board across these seat rungs and sat on it, I think this chair would still hold my weight today. In fact, that's a pretty good idea. Let's try it. Okay, uh, now that I'm about to do this, it does not seem like such a smart idea anymore, but uh, I said I was going to, so here we go. I, I, I didn't do this off camera. I, I don't know what's gonna happen. Huh? Well, uh, 
there, there you go. 215 pounds of me and uh, chair's doing fine. It's actually, I'm, I'm afraid to trust it, but it's surprisingly comfortable. Okay, so how is that possible? How did a chair like this hold together for so long and still be strong today? Well, it's probably because of the joinery, which is simple and kind of brilliant. This chair is held together by round tenons in round mortises, and you can see me use a similar joint all the time on this channel. When I use that joint, I drill all the way through whatever piece I'm sticking a leg into. My tenon goes all the way through, and then I insert a hardwood wedge to tighten it up. It's a very effective joint. It's, it's on the stool I'm sitting on right now. But this chair is different. The tenons are in blind mortises. They don't go all the way through. There's no wedge, and it's very likely that there's no glue. The joints are probably dry. That doesn't really make a lot of sense, but these joints work because the chair maker understood differential moisture, which is just a fancy way of saying that the rungs, which have the tenons on them, were bone dry, as dry as they could be, before they were inserted into posts that were still wet, maybe really wet. And then what happened as, as the post dries out, that mortise shrinks and it grabs on to that tenon. The tenon is oriented so the least shrinkage is up and down, and that mortise just grabs on there and it holds it with incredible hold, hold that can last for decades. It's a very simple strategy, but it's one that obviously works. Okay, in the interest of understanding how these joints work, we're gonna try and get one of them apart. And I couldn't have even have done this a couple days ago when I was storing the chair outside, but since then I've brought it into the air conditioning and the wood has dried out and a lot of the joints have loosened up. So I've got one of my clamps set up as a spreader and I think I can use that to force this joint apart and we can see what's going on inside. Let's give this a try. There's a lot of resistance here. It's very, wow, it's very difficult. You know, it's shocking how hard it is to get this piece apart especially since I've, I've started with a part of the chair that's already a little bit loose and it's still really fighting me. Okay, so this joint, it, it hasn't come apart completely but it's revealing a lot of the stuff that you would imagine. The tenon is actually quite small and the hole it's fitting into is a very, very tight fit. There's another key detail here that might not show up on camera, which is that the sides of the tenon here and in the back, those have been sliced off to make it narrower. So as that mortise closes up, there's nothing for it to grip on the sides so it can't split the post, but the top and the bottom are left full thickness. So that mortise dries out and closes up and it grabs that tenon with unbelievable strength. You can see I'm, I'm using one of my sturdiest clamps here and I'm still really struggling to get this chair pulled apart after it's been outside for years. This is an incredible joint. I don't see any sign of glue in here and it's still holding together. You know. When I started this video, I, I thought I already understood these chairs, but going through it over the last couple hours, I've learned so much more. These chairs are efficient, sturdy, surprisingly comfortable, and they're, they're pretty. I, I could easily imagine having one of these in my house. They're really impressive on a lot of levels, and, and chairs like this were made by country craftsmen, people who were supposedly ignorant and kind of uneducated. Well, they, they weren't educated where materials and physics and their environment came in. They understood this stuff on an incredibly fine and detailed level. It's impressive. I, I know the obvious question is, hey Rex, it's so impressive, uh, you gonna make one? And the answer is, yeah, I'm gonna try to. Um, there's a lot of roadblocks. I have to find silver maple that's long enough. 
I have to get oak and draw a knife into shape and dry it properly. I have to learn how to make the joint. I have to come up with something for the seat. Um, there's a lot, but I'm going to start within the next couple of days and hopefully you're going to see a completed copy of this chair before the winter sets in. And if you want to be more up to date on projects like this, the best thing you can do is become a patron. Not only do my patrons get early access to all my videos, but they also get behind the scenes stuff, sneak peeks, exclusive videos, vlogs. They get to track a lot of projects like this while they're happening. And we've introduced a lot of new things at Patreon recently. I'm especially proud of our new series called the Workbench Sessions. These are a series of exclusive lectures delivered by big names in the world of woodworking, and they're only available to my patrons. Uh, our first guest was Shannon Rogers. He gave us an amazing demonstration on saws, sawing, and body mechanics. Last month, we hosted Ron Hawk, Hawk Tools. He makes some of the best plain irons that you can find anywhere, and he gave us an amazing discussion on metallurgy and sharpening. This month, I'm super excited to announce that we're going to be hosting the editors of Mortis and Tenon magazine. They're going to be giving us a shop tour and doing a QA. and I, I can't even tell you how excited I am. And these videos are only available to my patrons because they're the ones that make all of this possible. If you'd like to be one of those people, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger. Check out all the rewards I have for the people who make these videos happen. And in addition to my patrons, I just love having viewers, and I always want people to know I appreciate you watching. So thanks for watching.